Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up for a change? Tonight we want to talk about prayer. Now I want you to pray that the Lord himself will speak to our hearts as representatives of the church. That our church will become a praying church like the New Testament church. Would you please pray? Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for the privilege once again that we can come together as leaders and representatives of your people. We're asking, Lord, that the spirit of prayer and supplication you pour upon every one of us, every family represented here, and consequently upon the whole church in Jesus' name, that this church will move in your power. In every house fellowship, in every zone, in every district, that once again, testimonies of signs, miracles, wonders, and the goodness of the Lord will be known everywhere in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. There you find not just the leaders, but the church praying. And in that same Acts of the Apostles, verse 38 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 38. And now, I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it shall come to naught. In verse 39, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply, ye be found even to fight against God. What you have read about in chapter 5, and what you find in the whole uh, book of the Acts of the Apostles, is the result of praying in the church. I'm talking to you tonight on the invincibility. Invincibility of a praying church. To be invincible means... To be so strong, too strong to be overcome or to be defeated. Invisibility then is the condition of being so strong and too strong to be overcome or defeated by the enemy. An invincible army is an army that is too strong for the enemy. Such was the condition of the early church. And there is only one reason we can give for that. The New Testament church was a praying church. There are three points for us to consider. Number one, the practice of praying in the church. The practice of praying in the church. Number two, the power of a praying church. The power of a praying church. Number three, the priorities of a praying church. As we look at number one, and we're looking at the practice of praying in the church. What I want us to do is to look at the Acts of the Apostles. Obviously, I will not be able to read all the references concerning prayer. But the few we read will show you how the New Testament church concentrated on praying. They were addicted to praying. They were devoted to praying. Start from chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Were the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. There we find the church praying. They didn't only start praying, they continued praying. And of course it was a purposeful praying. They were waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And they knew that even though the promise had been made to them, 
And the promise and the prophecy was very, very definite from the Old Testament. And the word of the Lord was very clear about it. Yet, they knew that they must pray. Chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Once again, we find the church... Not only that, they prayed spasmodically. That is, praying by feats. Praying when they felt like praying. It was a continuous thing. Chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Every day there was a stated period, a stated time of prayer. And even though these were apostles, they were not too busy. To pray. They prayed so much. Chapter 4, verse 31. It says in verse 31, chapter 4, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They had been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost before they prayed anew. And the Spirit of God came afresh upon the whole church. And then it says, as they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they spoke the word of God with boldness. In chapter 6, reading there in verse 4. It says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. You can search for yourself and look through the acts of the apostles and see the power of the early church and see the secret of their invincibility. The reason why the Jews could not overcome them, why the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not conquer them, why the traditions of the elders could not nullify the power and the effect and the impact of the gospel they were preaching. Let me just give you one reference more as you search for the rest yourself. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Verse 12, and when he had considered, that's when the angel went to the prison and the prison does open and it came out miraculously. It says, when he considered where to go, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose son name was Mark, where many, what were they doing? They were gathered together praying. You will see then the emphasis in the early church. It was a practice of praying. They prayed fervently and they prayed frequently. Why did they pray so much, so frequently and so fervently? Can I just give you some reasons? Number one, dependence on God. They depended on God. They knew that without God, they couldn't do anything. You should remember that these were the people that were hiding behind closed doors. They knew that the task was enormous and the difficulty was so much. Dependence upon God made them to pray. Number two, direction from God. They needed direction. Where do we go? How do we do the work? What strategies are we going to develop? How are we going to fulfill the great commission given unto us? Number three, the demand of godliness. The demand of godliness. They knew the standard. The high standard of godliness and righteousness and education and holiness. That the Lord demanded from them. It could not be done. And it could not be achieved in the power of the flesh. That demand of godliness drove them to their knees. Number four. The difficulty of spreading the gospel. You know, everywhere they were saying that the body of Jesus Christ had been stolen. And uh, they knew the difficulty of preaching the gospel to the people and of the people accepting the gospel. If the people were going to accept and the gospel was going to have an effect on them, it will require prayer on, on, on the part of the church. Number five, the depravity of the godless. Those godless people, they were depraved. And anything that will plant the gospel in their heart will be something that is beyond human oratory human ability or eloquence because of that they needed to pray number six the determination of the gainsayers there was the opposite religion 
the religion of the Jews. And those Jews, they were determined to the last drop of their blood that they would oppose the preaching of the gospel. And these people knew that their strength or energy could not match the determination of the gainsayers. Because of that, they knew that the only way they could succeed was to rush to God and pray. Number seven, the deafness of the guilty. The deafness of the guilty. Those people that nailed Jesus to the cross. The people that so opposed the gospel that they slew the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, they were guilty. But they were deaf to the voice of the Spirit. Because of that, they knew that if anything was going to unstop the ears of those guilty people, there was something they needed. That was prayer. Number eight, dominion over great giants. Whether in the material world, or in the spiritual world, or in the religious world, they knew they were up against giants. And they were great giants. And they wanted dominion, authority over them. And they knew the way they could do that was to pray. Number nine, the discernment of guile. Guile. That means of deceit. Of deception. Because you see, there were people that were trying to get into the church. And they came by guile. They came by deceit. And if at that early time of the foundation of the church, all those deceitful people had been successful, the church would have been overrun by people that were not sincere. And to be able to discern the, 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 the people that had deception or guile, they needed to pray. Number 10, the desire for growth. They had watched the Lord Jesus Christ and he had said he that believeth on me uh, the works I do he shall do and greater works than these shall he do because I go to the father how are we going to grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ they knew that the only way the power of heaven the supernatural could flow into their lives was by prayer the desire for growth made them to see that they must pray number 11 the defense of the gospel the defense of the gospel the gospel had to be defended the gospel had to be preserved for the generations to come and they knew that the only way that could be done will be by the power of god upon their lives number 12 devotion to his glory devotion to his glory because they wanted the glory of god in all things and they wanted the sacrifice of jesus the exaltation of jesus to be a reality and i if i be lifted up eh, from the earth i will draw all men unto myself all those things put together made the people to feel the necessity of prayer and those things are still important today and how we too we should go to the lord in prayer and as a church we specialize in prayer we addict ourselves to praying we, we abandon ourselves into praying and we say like the apostles too we will give ourselves unto prayer and to the ministry of the word i go to point number two the power of a praying church the power of a praying church once again we're looking at acts of the apostles and you want to see what happened when they prayed what happened at the beginning of their prayer and then what continued to happen as they continued in prayer in acts of the apostles chapter 2 reading there in verse 4 and they were all filled with the holy ghost they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ had said that they should not depart from Jerusalem until ye be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because he said unto them that they will be baptized in the Holy Ghost even as John baptized with water. When they asked an irrelevant question, he told them that's not for you to know but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. And they continued to pray and it was in in that situation of prayer they were all filled with the holy ghost the power came into the church in a chapter that same chapter 2 on your own you can read verse 37 you will see the convicting power in their words, in their preaching. Then you can read verse 41. How 3,000 came to the Lord in one single day is the power of a praying church. In chapter 3 of Acts of the Apostles, reading from verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Some but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. 
And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up and st stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. That was the power they had because they had a praying church. Chapter 4. Reading from verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And then they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke the word of God with boldness, verse 33, and with great power. Gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then it says, and great grace was upon them. How many of them? All. That's the power of a praying church. You remember chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 12 all through to verse 16, but we don't have time to read everything in verse 15 now. In so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. That was the power, quickening power, miracle working power, wonder working power in the early church because it was a praying church in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. You remember how they were persecuted and they went out and they were scattered here and there and everybody went on preaching and Philip in his own case he got to Samaria and he preached the word. Now in verse 6, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taking with palsies paralysis and that were lame were healed and of course in acts of the apostles chapter 12 when the apostle peter had been imprisoned by because they were praying the angel came down from heaven and opened the door in fact the iron gates opened of its own accord that's the power of a praying church think about it a single righteous praying christian is mighty and powerful go further a united praying family is an unbeatable team go further a redeemed praying church is irresistible and invincible such a church number one will have authority with heaven the command on earth and it's recognized in heaven number two such a church will see salvation for multitudes of people we've read the reference already in the acts of the apostles number three such a church will see speedy steady progress in evangelization and we're told that many thousands believe in jerusalem and by the time you get to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 6, they said, These that have turned the world upside down, they have come hither. It's because it was a praying church. Number four, such a church will experience the free flow of the gifts of the Spirit. Such a praying church will experience in all their meetings, not once in a while, the free flow of spiritual gifts. Number five, such a church, praying church, will silence, paralyze the powers of darkness. Number six, such a church will experience healing, signs, and wonders. Number seven, such a church will see the glory of God and the exaltation of Christ. That's why we need to pray so that the power of God will be mighty upon our church. I go to point number three. Priorities of a praying church. That is, if the church is going to be a praying church, what are some things that are not negotiable? Some things that we count essential, important priorities as a church. Uh, in uh, First Peter chapter 3, Verse 7, First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, that is, dwell with wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as many heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. If the church is going to see the power of God in praying, the power of God through praying. We must make sure that the families that are represented in the church, there is love in the family. 
togetherness in the family. Unity in the family. Because think about it. If the families are disunited, if the families are not living according to the word of God, and the members of these families, they are the members of the church, they come together, our prayer will be hindered. Then in, in James, James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed. If we're going to make prayer something essential and important, it means there must be openness to one another. Openness, frankness to one another, affection and forgiveness to one another. We're able to open up our hearts. So I'm sorry I offended you. I'm sorry the careless thing I said. I'm sorry the way I treated you. It is now we'll be able to pray effectually. Then it says at the latter part of that verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It means there'll be practical righteousness among us. No bitterness. Bitterness is contrary to holiness. No anger. No aggressive kind of uh, action against one another. There will be goodwill towards one another. And then in First John chapter 3, reading there in verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And do those things which are pleasing in his sight. It means that we are committed to pleasing God and pleasing one another. As long as uh, you are pleasing your neighbor and that thing that your neighbor wants you to do is not displeasing unto God. We please God and we see how to please one another without offending God. And then in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4 verse 24. If we're going to be a church committed to praying, Acts 4 verse 24. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. With one accord. That means there's going to be unity from sincere hearts among the people of God. Think about it then. If the church is going to be a praying church, what will be our priorities? Number one, love and understanding in the families. Before you come to the church, before you come to the prayer meeting, if there is anything between you and your wife, you and your husband, settle everything so that you are coming to the church, you are coming to the prayer meeting without any guilt or any burden or any strife in the heart. Number two, openness, affection, forgiveness among members of the church. When there is love and openness and we're able to confess our faults to one another without a feeling ashamed because we are just of one body. Then our prayers will be answered. Number three, practical righteousness and goodwill one towards the other. Number four, pleasing God and pleasing one another as long as we do not displease the Lord. Number five, unity from sincere hearts. We really love one another. We love the word of God. We love the same standard. On the basis of that, there's unity among us. Number six, fervent, frequent praying with faith. That's what we find in the Acts of the Apostles. They prayed fervently. They prayed frequently. And they prayed with faith. Number seven, unselfishly praying for others. Not only thinking about ourselves, we think of, uh, of, of the need of the church and the need of the members and the need of uh, the community. Praying unselfishly for others with emphasis on God's glory and emphasis on the spiritual needs. If we will do this, things will change in our church. I said things will change in our church. God has raised us up to be a giant, not only in this city, not only in this nation, at least a giant of a church in the continent of Africa. And the Lord will do it. I said the Lord will do it. If we can pray, there is hope for this nation. And there is hope for this continent. We will pray. I said we will pray. Why don't we rise up and start tonight? And just uh, let go, let go yourself and with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind remember the early church and picture yourself as a member of the early church if you were there how would you have prayed you will open up your heart you'll open up your spirit you open up your mind and then that prayer will gush out fervently and whenever the church is calling for prayer meeting in the district in the group or in the whole church you will be eager to be there and then we will bombard heaven with our prayers